This is the Etches Collection, a new paleontology museum in the Kimmeridge in Dorset. I saw about this in the TV, so I thought that, okay, let's go and see it, it's new. This is the first week that Etches Museum is opened. And, and even this first week, it has a lot of visitors. We just arrived 10 o'clock when the museum opens. It's now 11.05. And a lot of people already have been here, from foreign countries even. That's interesting. So, and I saw Steve actually with such a love and care. He cleaned the floor tile. He saw a little patch on it. He cleans it. He has such a strong feeling for this place. As his life achievement, you know. And he said to me that he had a lot of papers published and had a lot more in the publication. And this is uh, Steve. everything with just text okay so there are other additional sort of bits of information that we can't put on there so if you want to come round and I'll show you some of the more interesting things do so if you don't just carry on all right so if we start here um, if you're very clever and I spent some of the yard they probably noticed that actually they've got the text wrong because a femur is this bone here in your leg Okay, and as you look at that arrow, it's pointing to the humerus of your arm. Mm. And that's wrong, but we've, it's just that the person who did the graphics got it all wrong. So, okay, so these, all I can say is these are very large propogas. They're, they're parts of the femur, parts of the humerus, the plesiosaurs and pliosaurs. Now, pliosaurs are exactly the same as a plesiosaur, and if you know a plesiosaur, it's like a Loch Ness monster with a long neck and a long tail. And the pliosaurs were the same family, but they had very short necks and very large skulls. And these things grew to about 20 odd meters, and they were the top of the food chain. So they were the, they anything and everything, all right? And we can demonstrate that when we get around the corner over there, okay? Because we find masses and masses and masses of predation. And even when you look at that, that limb bone there, you'll see it's quite well lit. You'll see some dents and holes in it, and they're punctured. Actually grabbed hold of it and ripped it apart, but it never ate that bit because when these pliosaurs ate flesh, they also ate bone. They didn't chew their food; they just ripped it apart like crocodiles, swallowed it, and the digestion juices dissolved the bone as well. So they took anything and everything. Okay. Um, we've wasted space here, but I don't know if you know what coelacanths are. Does everyone know? Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a there's a lady. Uh, I forget the first name, but Latimer her name was in the 1930s. She was, because everyone thought coelacanths were extinct, okay? And in the 1930s, there was a lady in a fish market in South Africa saw this a coelacanth for sale. She thought, oh my God, 
this is a, you know, this is the first one we've ever seen. So she had to get it back to the museum before, because in those days refrigeration was, you know, there was no refrigeration. She got it back to the, um, the museum, and it, of course it hit the world press. Everyone wanted a coelacanth. And it nearly caused about their extinction then, because everyone was longlining for coelacanth to put in their museum, you know? But anyhow, they're a sort of fish that they thought was a transitional species, i.e. a fish that its limbs were developing like legs, or its fins were developing like legs or limbs, you know? And it was a, like a fish that was actually about to crawl out of the sea and go on land to carry out its next stage of life. But it never did. And if you've ever seen the films on coelacanths, they sort of, they go upside down and they use their sort of fins as limbs, but they've, they've never gone, they've never come out of the sort of water, as one might say, and they're still living in two groups uh, today. And this is just, we've just put the bones back, that's what I've got of it, of a really large ceiling cap, okay? There's one, it's just a small skull of another one, okay? But they're quite rare in the fossil record here at Kimridge, okay? Because some of the fish you see here, the reason we've got the money to actually build this is actually, we're lucky because it's staying indoors, that, that, that actually it, most of the stuff is completely new to science. And when we went for funding, for this, we went, approached the Naturalistry Museum and said, could we get a le letter of backing for this collection to be housed here? And they came back, one of the guys, and said, um, we reckon we've got the best fish collection in the world, but the material that you've got in the collection is supersedes ours by far. And that's the same now with the reptiles we've got, and the pterosaur material and everything else. So this is the reason in, in the, the, the importance of the collection is actually gain this money and you're staying here in Dorset where it should stay. You shouldn't have to go to London to see Dorset specimens. Okay? Yeah, carry on. Right. Um, you may not look, but you're looking down the throat of the shark there. Okay? So if you look around the periphery, you'll see all the sort of teeth. And the interesting thing is on the left-hand side, you can see a funny little plate with like a barbed hook on it. And if you look down the side there, there's another bigger one. And there they, they hang over the heads of the male sharks. They're there for a display or something, or, but they don't, they don't occur on the sort of females, okay? So, and they're very rare in the fossil record because sharks, you may or may not know, their bodies are made of cartilage, and cartilage does not readily fossilize. You know, fish are made of bone, bone preserves better than cartilage, okay? So any shark light, we normally find lots and lots of teeth because they're made of gamoid, and we find the thin spines, but the body parts are really rare in the fossil record. So that's the first semi-3D skeleton. Shark we've got. Um, ichthyosaurs again, and if you go to Lyme Regis, if you really wanted to find an ichthyosaur, Lyme Regis would be the best place in Britain to find one. They're two a penny. I know that they're all that common, but anyhow, they're very common. A friend of mine claimed there's three specimens in a year once. Okay. But in the Kimmage clay, they're really rare. We find lots and lots of individual bones of ichthyosaurs, but to find something like this is really rare. And this is from a, and if you say it was in a white stone, actually, mm -hmm. it's still from the Kimmage clay, it's from a coppered limestone band. But if you go down the bay and walk for two miles, you'll see the coppered limestone band in the Kimmage clay there. And so we found a, the front quarters of an ichthyosaur, but it's, it's, it's actually really interesting because, again, it's completely new to science. And you ask why, how do I know it's completely new to science? You look along its teeth, they're really small and sharp, okay? And when you study this, no linear lines up the two crowns. So in other words, it's a, it's a specialist feeder, and it's unlike any other, other ichthyosaur we found up to date. It's also got a big eye, and of course, so you think, well, it must be feeding on something special, because the teeth are not robust enough to feed on these big, heavily scaled fish, okay? So we think that it's feeding on squid. Now, squid, during the day, go down deep, and they hide in the sort of darkness of there, and they come up at night to see. Well, if you've got a big eye, you can actually dive down and still see. All right, so they cast their, their prey down there where they're hiding. Okay, so this is a specialist feeder, and it's got some funny looking cartilage along the tops of the ears. I'm not going to bore you too much. Which bit of that did you find? Sorry? Which bit of that did you see? Do you want to know the story? Yeah. That, yeah, right, that middle, you can see the middle there, I've joined, and I found that about three or four years prior to finding that. Now, what you, what you must realise is you don't see it like this. Yeah, no, if you, you could imagine a, a block of limestone that high, bit, okay, bit, and then you see the cross section of those bones. And you can see a line of bones, okay? So then you've got to thin the block down, which we do with a hammer and chisel. We don't use those fossil hammers that, you know, we use a big hammer and some big chisels and 
and they're sharpened in a way, like razor sharp, you actually go into the limestone, split it, and delaminate it. And anyhow, when I cleaned it, because you couldn't see all that, when I cleaned it, a friend said, well, can find the rest of it, it must be there. I said, it's not there. I've looked, I've looked. About three or four years later, I knelt down to look at them, and I could see another line of bones on another block. So when I, I split this big block, and it was so big that I had to use like levers. In other words, it was so heavy, I couldn't lift the slabs I split off. So I had to use another chisel, lever it up, slice some pebbles in, I do kids, this is, and then you could just kick it off your foot because it just rolls on the pebbles, and then split the next bit, because you can only, I had to get down to the bottom of it. And then when I split it off, it came out in two blocks. You couldn't see any of this, by the way. It came out in two blocks. So it was so heavy, I separated it in my rucksack, it was a 100 litre rucksack with my jumper. And when I got back home, I, after I recovered, of course, because it takes a while, seriously, I'm not joking, you know, I opened the rucksack up and found, oh no, the jumper had gone, and so the other one of the slabs. And then I realized, on the tip of the snag, there was a block missing there, and I thought, oh no, it, it, in cross section, you couldn't see the teeth, so it didn't look like a snag. So I had the day off the next day, and because I worked in the south, so that's all right. And I went back, the jumper had washed away, but right where I picked the rugs up, that slab was there, so I thought, oh great. Mm -hmm. Then I had to go through about three or four hundred weight of rubble to try and find the bit that was missing. And when I found that, I tipped it up, and I could see the tip of the snag. God, I've got it. So then it was a case of cleaning this thing, and it's beautifully preserved. You can see it's, it's virtually uncrushed. Okay, the skull's crushed down, but if you look on side view, it's not crushed down dead flat like this one over there. Um, so it, it's really, really nice. And since then, because it's flat of the cliff, I've found more of this. So I've found part of the pelvis of it. So when we describe this new design, all those features will be built into that description. So it's really, so it's all cutting edge science, this is. You know, fossils, new stuff, completely new designs, and then you can spend 10 lifetimes here collecting this stuff and you'll find something new each time. Oh, can um, I ask a question? So yeah, it's about on. sharks. Sharks are cartilaginous. They have, uh, they don't have very strong classified bone, but they do have very strong classified teeth. Yes, they well, do. How, how, is this, is this an, an evolutionary, that something that evolved from an armoured clay or something right, like no, that? Right, no. How uh, did that actually happen? Well, the teeth are actually, they're not made of carpets of teeth, they're made of gammon. Yeah. Right? And that's right. an enamel, okay? Which so they're means, enamel. And they're enamel. They got it's like your teeth. Dentin? It's like your teeth. Have your they got dentin? Um, well. No, not as sharks, okay. no. Good lad. And you... Oh yeah, no, we know that. <laughs> yeah, these aren't dinosaurs, but you're right. <laughs> Hang on, you jump up and tell him. Come on. <laughs> Good. Well done. <laughs> So, get back to this. Um, you, you see these goose barnacles, they get attached to like things that float across from America, and they, they actually just hang off a bit of floating debris and just still feed through the water. And they're called goose barnacles, they've got a big long fleshy pedicle. Now, they're known in the Jurassic, there's no, no doubt about that, but when I found the complete one here, I just thought oh, it's the same as everyone else has found, you know? So, 25 years later, the long came professor and said, um, and I had a look at these barnacles, and he said, well, do you realise Charles Darwin's passion was barnacles? And that particular barnacle you've got is still living today off the of Japan. He said Darwin assumed he would find its ancestors back in the Jurassic. He said he never did, and you've got it. So you've got that missing link. But also, he said, he only found one, during his lifetime, he was an authority on barnacles, living out of fossil. He found one new fossil barnacle. He said, you've got five from the Kiris clay in your collection. And we've also got the world's oldest coloured barnacle, so you see a photograph of that. So that's quite interesting. Since then, I found a 2.8 metres long, with millions of them. All right, so it's only a two metre long jaw. I can assure you, they probably had a four metre skull. You know, they were big, they were huge. We, in the Natural Museum, we see two sockets like that. And we've, we've measured some of their teeth, they're 16 inches long. And that's including the root. And the reason they're 16 inches long in the sense they're all relative. It's actually, they're anchored well into the jaws. So that gives them indication that they're, they've got a 
really fierce and powerful bite, and they can re resist torsional stresses where your teeth will come out if you did too much, you know, the roots would just pull out. But these are so deeply embedded that they can actually just rip anything apart. They're very, very strong. Okay? So if we get the slide. So if we go to this, we, we go along the thing. Right, the age of the rocks here, good question, 157 to 152 million years old. And the thickness of the rocks here that from that time is 530 metres thick. And as you walk east, the beds dip, so you walk through time. So we can actually collect from the whole series. Okay. And here, okay, so we've got eat or be eaten. So this fish that predominantly feed on different things. So we've got fish, like these, like these, like, like um, um, tarpon. Okay, so they, in other words, they swam behind other fish and just suck them in. Not quite well, but it's a fish that has gone in the stomach. Okay? These, these are the pigment They've got these crushing teeth, they've been on like shellfish, they're like right, right, rats, the all sorts of things. There's another one here that's got three rows of teeth, and this is a, another described entry of lower jaw fish, and that's rather like an anchor fish that sat on the sea floor. Three rows of teeth which is close to your real pattern of life. But all, you've got to realise that some of these are completely new, so we've not yet been described. That one there looks very similar to, is it the Cat? Yeah, similar, yeah. Yeah, very similar. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got these in the stomach. No, there's nothing in the stomach. Oh, right, no, 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 we're good. That's no, but we'll see some of those things. Right, ammonite. Does everyone know what an ammonite is? What is it then? It's a mollusk. Like a squid in shell. Yes, yeah, not a snail, it's a squid in shell. And it had a hydronome that sucked water and ejected itself along. There are, so a squid in a shell is an excellent food source of something. And what we found, because this is this sea's about 200 meters deep, so anything that hits the sea floor is unaffected by currents or storms or anything like that. What I found is hundreds of these ammonites with big chunks missing. So when you put the ammonites together, you, you see the chunks are always in the same place. And, and it's the back of the body chamber. So the soft tissue in the, the squid is anchored to the back of the body chamber. Now, if you can actually break that attachment, you can take the whole tissue out. Mm -hmm. So some of perfected the techniques of doing that. And originally we thought it was fish, like these big pickle knots, but actually, I don't think that's the case now. They're not clever enough to do that, I don't think. But what we've got are cuttlefish. And if you've ever seen cuttlefish octopus, they're really good, very skilled sort of at getting over problems. All they do is grasp them with tentacles, position them, they've got a parrot like the French shell and take the fish out of them. So that's the first predation you see on that one. But the Kimish clay being, like I said before, the least interest in the British fossil collector, all of a sudden we're finding complete new information from this overlooked formation. Okay, so we've got, this is an ichthyosaur. You've seen it on the front cover of our brochure, but basically it's the most complete Kimmeridgian ichthyosaur you will see. Go to the Natural History Museum and say, Can I see any of your Kimmeridgian ichthyosaur? They've got nothing except for one splat specimen, which is not really good. But this one, if you notice, the thing about ichthyosaur, it's got a really large head and a small body. The tail's missing, by the way. Okay. And that indicates it's a juvenile. <coughs> and then if you look under the ribs, it's just full of food. It's full of fish and it's full of squid. And the squid have got these. Funny hooks on the tentacles to put this sort of prey in, for this meal, to feed on small fish. And there's a, a bone there, which is it's raised in relief, so it's a resistant compaction. Don't forget this is squashed down now. All the pressure of the overburden is just squashed this down flat. And what we do when we find these animals is we actually we turn them upside down in fact. Because when it goes down in the mud, before it gets covered up, it starts to decay. So the bit that sticks down in the mud is the best bit of prep. So we all turn it up the other way and prep it. That includes fish as well. Mm -hmm. So that's a really interesting one. You can see if you look close, it's got blood teeth. So it's feeding on quite hard scale prey. Not like that ichthyosaur we just seen over there with the extremely sharp teeth. Okay. Now we get on to the mega predators now. So ichthyosaurs are an excellent food source for bigger animals. And what we found is evidence of predation. So if you look there, there's a lower jaw of an ichthyosaur like this. One half is missing, there's a big five months got a crack on that. This slab here is remains of about 16 foot thickness. And if you look at all the bones, they're all broken. 
And the collection here is you look at the pattern, this, this cotton, or the top third one down, is a line across, and you see shards of bone all held there, where a tooth has actually just gone into the bone and sharded out the flex of bone off of the figure. But because it's still covered in carpet and flesh, it's remained. So you only might be prejudiced again from the underside. Um, so we can't say with any authority what the predator was. It would either be a plant or, or a crocodile. You see the big long roots, you can see black and that one crack. Okay. And so they feel very efficient with anything like this. And think about, you know, being 18, 16 foot fifty so no problem at all. The interesting one is this one. Have you ever seen on YouTube is me cutting this thing out? And when I found it, it looked like it preserved that side down. When I prepped it the other way up, it was preserved that not But if you look across the back of the bone, they're all broken. And there's shards of bone hanging there. Fish has just had its head bit off. Oh. And that's just gone down on the sea floor. There was no more of it. When you dug it out, you expect the whole skeleton. No, it's gone. And that was just the remains of it. Alright, if you that's, I'm not telling the fish. There's another composer, that's a part of the lid over the juvenile dinosaur, and you see it's got a line of three bite marks across there, and the leading lines on the two frame are actually pressed with those bite marks, and no surprise for being on the small Another lid bone there where a two frame is for a group, and it is all very red there with two teeth, that's a crack bone in half, so two of those teeth are cracked in half. So we've got masses and masses and masses of these things. And this one, interestingly, it doesn't have to do with predation, but there's a new species of crocodile there. Does anyone know where its eyes were? In the swamp. What's the question? No. No, they're not. Actually, they're in those sticks there. Okay? But interestingly, this one, 